All right, from one crime to another. Yesterday, as we showed you, the Senate held hearings on proposals to reduce jail time in the war on drugs. The push is important. It builds on Attorney General Eric Holder's August announcement that the Obama administration was going to cut the use of mandatory minimum sentences for certain nonviolent offenders. Now, this very hour, Holder is expected to speak about that issue to the Congressional Black Caucus, which for years has criticized racial disparities in sentencing. And the effort's getting a boost from some pretty unlikely places, which is the subject of our newest presumed guilty report out today. Black Hollywood. This idea that one size fits all, this idea that federal sentences should have no discretion. Our federal mandatory minimum sentences are simply heavy handed and arbitrary. Paul may not represent the median GOP, but there are signs that a new thinking is spreading. Jacob Solem writes for Reason, a libertarian magazine. At the state level, in surprising places like Texas, which you think of as being a really you know, tough on crime state, we've started to see sentencing reform where there's an alliance between progressives and conservatives, uh, both of whom agree this is a waste of money and also agree that it's not right. And in the past year, Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia have each reduced harsh sentencing, and each are Republican-run legislatures. Tim Lynch is another leading libertarian voice on this issue. He is director of the criminal justice program at the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank, and author of After Prohibition, an adult approach to drug policies, and a member of the D.C. and Supreme Court bar. Let's get right to it. What is the libertarian critique of these high jail terms in the war on drugs? Well, one of the things that has happened is you have a lot of Tea Party people coming and joining forces with liberals because the Tea Party people and libertarians start with the basic proposition that we're in the middle of a fiscal crisis and we have to take a cost-effective approach when it comes to policies in the criminal justice system. And we spend a lot of money on prisons in this country. We spend about $80 billion a year. And what the new consensus is, is that we've got to make sure we're spending this money smartly and locking up the right people and stop spending money locking up the wrong people. Mm. Well, and speaking of libertarians, Rand Paul has been a leading voice in this effort. He testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday. And here's a little bit of what he had to say. The majority of illegal drug users and dealers nationwide are white, but three-fourths of the people in prison for drug offenses are African-American or Latino. Why are arrest rates so lopsided? Because it's frankly easier to go into the urban areas and make arrests than it is to go into suburban areas. Arrest statistics matter when applying for federal grants. Doesn't take much imagination to understand that it's easier to round up, arrest, and convict poor kids than it is to convict rich kids. Tim, obviously highlighting that this is a uh, more of a structural issue than, than a political fight, pointing that, you know, uh, it's about cost and it's about justice. How important, though, is it to have a voice like Rand Paul really leading the way in this fight? It's very important because one of the points Rand Paul made yesterday was that the federal government throws money at state law enforcement people for like drug task forces and one of the criteria for whether or not that money is being well spent is how many arrests have they made. And so Rand Paul makes the point that law enforcement people sweep into poor communities, arrest poor people who are not in a good position to defend themselves and we got all these people coming into the criminal justice system and then they get hit with these mandatory minimum sentencing and mm. and the, the point that conservatives and libertarians are beginning to make is that this doesn't deliver public safety which conservatives put a premium on right. uh, we're just throwing money and getting people into the system but we're not getting uh, uh, public safety as a result of these policies so people are beginning to rethink it and it's not just liberals anymore it's it's conservatives and Tea Party people yeah I think that's right and we're also starting to see some noises from the religious right about the, the moral component of all of this but I wanted to ask you about something you were writing about Tim uh, Ari referenced in the lead that Eric Holder has uh, has made reforms in mandatory minimum sentencing calling on at the federal level for them to be used less you called those reforms puny. I wanted to know what, what you would like to see him do. Well, the, one of the reasons I said that is because Eric Holder gave a speech talking about the number of people locked up in America. But when you look at the way in which our system operates, our system is decentralized. So he has made a change in federal law, but is that going to have a dramatic impact on the number of people locked up in America? No, because most of the action is at the state and local level by state and local law enforcement. And also Eric Holder put in a lot of criteria about whether uh, people would qualify for his 
scaling back on mandatory minimums. So, so we'll have to see how federal prosecutors interpret that criteria to see if his uh, proposal is going to have uh, much of an impact at all. What I would think uh, what's going to have a greater impact is the states like Washington and Colorado that are going even further than Eric Holder in rethinking the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. Voters in those two states approved referenda last November that is going to end the war on marijuana in those states. That's going to have a dramatic impact on their state systems, and we're going to see more movement in that direction in the coming years. That's the type of thing that's going to have a dramatic impact on our system. Tim, I absolutely agree with you on almost everything you've said, and I love that you used the word referenda. That doesn't get into conversation often enough. Um, but in a lot of states, these convictions lead to permanent loss of voting rights in some places, and a lot of times they lead to an inability to get uh, meaningful work for the people who are convicted. Uh, Michelle Alexander in the New Jim Crow writes about the, the pain that this leads to. She says many ex-offenders experience an existential angst associated with their permanent permanent social exclusion. One of the people she spoke to um, who was convicted said that he feels like you broke the law, bang, you're not part of us anymore. And part of what's happening is that uh, attaching this sort of uh, uh, scarlet letter to these folks for the rest of their lives, we're losing a lot in, uh, in human potential in America. Absolutely. I mean, just again, going back to marijuana, we arrest about 800,000 people a year just on marijuana offenses. So this becomes a part of their permanent criminal record, even if they don't go to prison for long periods of time. And that hobbles their efforts to get a job and to enter the mainstream economy and hurts their lives in many other ways. The, the proper reforms are not just to look at the back end of the system and help them re-enter, although that's a step in the right direction, but we have to look at the front end of the system. Stop this war on marijuana, stop the war on drugs, and that'll stop the hordes of people that are coming into the system at the front end. That's where we need to go. Yeah, and Tim, we should mention three of the states that have actually rolled back some of this harsh sentencing, Alabama, Tennessee and Georgia, all Republican-controlled legislatures. So a lot of scrambling going on. Thanks for spending some time with us on it today. Thank you.